I don't want you to be misled. On the liturgical calendar of the Presbyterian Church, this Sunday is not known as Mardi Gras Sunday. Frankly, there would be some members of the Presbyterian family a bit concerned that we were celebrating Mardi Gras at all, let alone on the day set apart on the liturgical calendar as a time to celebrate the transfiguration of the Lord. I'm not saying that Presbyterians are cold people, though I have visited some churches where the ushers wore ice skates. The transfiguration of the Lord is the last stop in the extended season of Epiphany, a season that began way back on the Sunday after Christmas. Running in parallel to that observance in many communities in the United States, but most notably in New Orleans, is the season of Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras season can begin on Twelfth Night, Epiphany, and it lasts until Shrove Tuesday, this Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. When the clock strikes midnight, the party's over. The streets empty. The street sweepers move in. And then it's Ash Wednesday. These celebrations trace their ancestry back to medieval France and are celebrated with unique variations in the communities that still observe them. Mardi Gras is, of course, a season of excess. Wild celebrations, fantastic floats and phenomenal formal balls from the various crews, delicious foods, beads, and hangover remedies are all part of Mardi Gras. It's a time of celebration, merriment, and unbridled excitement. And then comes Lent. No celebrations. The floats are gone. Delicious foods give way to fasting. The merriment is subdued. The celebrations are silenced. Excitement is replaced by repentance and introspection. Ask most Presbyterians which season is more appropriate or acceptable, and the general agreement would be Lent. We're not really a party kind of people. We're more subdued. As Garrison Keeler once said of the people of Lake Wobegon, when we let our hair down, it's not that big a deal. We're a rather short-haired people. Most of what Presbyterians call celebrations wouldn't even be noticed by other people walking by. We don't go in for excess, and we're suspicious of those who do. As one of my friends from the South often reminds me, most Presbyterians look like their shoes are too tight and they were weaned on persimmon juice. So when we look at the story of Jesus' transfiguration, it's not surprising that we look at the three disciples a bit disdainfully. Peter, James, and John, that inner circle of the disciples, are with Jesus on the mountain and they see everything that takes place. They see Jesus transfigured illuminated in the most profound way. They see the presence of Moses and Elijah. They have ringside seats to the whole thing. And their response, let's not allow this to end. Let's build places for you to stay. Let's just stay here in the pure light of this moment and let's glory in it. For generations, Peter, James, and John have been derided for their desire to stay on the mountain. More sermons have been preached about the silliness of the disciples wanting to start a housing project on the mountaintop. We look down on these three as just being stupid. But the real point of the story, or so we have been told, is that when they come down from the mountain, it's time to move toward Jerusalem and the cross. The importance of the transfiguration, some scholars and traditions tell us, is that this is the turning point in Jesus' ministry, and he is heading for the death for which, according to them, he entered this world. The transfiguration is about Lent. But what if, instead of Lent, the story of the transfiguration is about Mardi Gras? 
What if instead of being a story about impending suffering and death, it was a story about revelation and clarity? What if we thought about transfiguration as being less about sorrow and more about joy? Take a look at the story from a different angle. Peter, James, and John are with Jesus on the mountaintop. Suddenly the lights come on. They see Jesus for who he really is. They've had their doubts and their questions. They've had their suspicions and even some reservations. But they've also had those inklings and hunches. They've heard Jesus' words. They've seen those words move people. They've seen Jesus in action. He casts out evil. He brings wholeness where there was brokenness. He breaks un unreasonable cultural and religious norms. He challenges hypocrisy and, and condemns insincerity. And now, in this moment we call transfiguration, there is clarity. The veil is pulled back. There is an epiphany of the first order. They see Jesus for who he is. And as if, it, as if an imprimatur was needed, there appears Elijah and Moses, as if to say that this Jesus is to continue the work of these two champions of Israel. What would you think at that moment? Let's head down the mountain so Jesus can die? Of course not. You and I and most reasonable people would want to stay right there on the mountain and have a little Mardi Gras. We would want to celebrate and whoop and holler. We wouldn't want the dirgish sounds we're known for. We'd want a little Dixieland. We wouldn't want to fast. We'd want some gumbo and po'boys and maybe some beignets and coffee from Cafe Du Monde or at least a good old Polish punchki from Donut Bank. The story is told of Archimedes who was working on a mathematical solution that would help him determine the amount of water that was displaced when a solid object was placed in water. Archimedes didn't have much of a life. He worked for a really long time trying to come up with the equation that would serve as the answer. When he found it, according to legend, he shouted, I found it! Now old Archimedes was a Greek, so when he shouted, I found it, he shouted, Eureka! And that's why we still say it when making a discovery. For Peter, James, and John, the transfiguration was a Eureka moment. They had found it, the answer they were looking for. They knew who Jesus was. And what was their response? Laissez les bon temps rouler. Now that's Cajun for let the good times roll. Let's have a little Mardi Gras on the mountain. Let's build some shelters and let's have a party. <coughs> Years after the transfiguration, the Apostle Paul was writing his letters. In the second letter to the Corinthians, Paul uses an epiphany language to talk about realizing who Jesus is. He writes, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the mind of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Paul understood that when we see Jesus for who he really is, it is as though a curtain is being pulled back. The veil is lifted from our eyes. What was blurry is now clear, and we see what's really going on. We see who God is and who we were created to be. We see how life is best lived and how love can be constantly shared. In Jesus Christ, we see compassion, gentleness, understanding, and authentic, com authentic humanity. In Jesus Christ, we see God's love made 
visible, tangible, and concrete. And when we see that, when it becomes real to us, like old Archimedes, we shout, Eureka! And when we are in the midst of a revelation like that, like Peter, James, and John, we just want to say, Laissez-les, bon temps roulé. Let the good times roll. Let's have a little Mardi Gras on the mountain. And let's get ready for that Mardi Gras that is to come. Laissez-les, bon temps roulé. For now and evermore. Amen.